the government has launched schemes such as the Rashtriya Swast Bima Yojana to insulate poor households from health related financial shocks. Yet, we find that over 80% of India's population is excluded from the fold of any sort of formal health cover. We have with us today Mr. Jack Langdonbrunner, a senior economist who has worked extensively on issues relating to health financing and design of health insurance systems. Mr. Langdonbrunner is currently with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a senior program officer. He will speak to us today about his experience in health financing reforms in several countries and the lessons that India can draw from this. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to the talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to begin with a topic that you've written extensively about. Mm -hmm. These are the four core functions that you have identified as being part of the health financing system, mm -hmm. which you say determine the structure as well as the success of a health financing system. Could mm -hmm. you just walk us briefly through what these functions are? Sure. Uh, the four functions uh, in brief are um, uh, where does the money come from? Uh, how do you pool and manage the, the money, secondly? Third, how do you then allocate the funds through purchasing of services and goods? And then fourthly, the delivery system itself uh, that delivers the services uh, to the, the individual and families. So you can think about these first three functions of health financing as a, uh, in a very similar way with a family budget. So you as a family member are bringing in money. You're bringing it in from various sources. Uh, secondly, once you have that money, then you need to manage it. You can put it into stocks. You can put it into the bank. You can put it under your pillow. You can do various things to, to manage it. And then finally, how do you spend it? And when you spend it, you really want to get the highest value, the best return for your money. When you go to the store, when you buy clothing, when you buy fruits or vegetables, you really want to spend your money in a way that brings back the best value, the highest satisfaction for you and your family. So these are the three core functions that we think about first with health financing. There are important differences, though, with a family budget. One is... With a family budget, you often have full information about the goods and services you're buying. And in health, you often don't have that. You often don't have that. So that's a, that's a first important difference. The second important difference is that people incur catastrophic cost for their health care. You can be in a car accident. You can have a, a serious accident. And so you incur catastrophic cost, and you may not be prepared for that. So that's the second important difference from a, a family budget situation. And there are others. There are others. But uh, certainly, um, uh, it's important to think about these three financing functions and then how they match with the delivery system in terms of the services for the individual and the family. Now, bringing you to the Indian context, we have a very high out-of-the-pocket uh, expense ratio in India. And at the same time, we are grappling with issues of poverty and a very high percentage of the population being in the unorganized sector. Given all these factors, how would you say the government should think about designing its health systems and health financing programs? Yes, I think there are many challenges in India. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, India is moving relatively rapidly in terms of thinking about the issues and coming up with a solution. So I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about what India will do over the next few years. Going back to our four functions, let's think first about where the money might come from. Of course, there are general revenues that come from the government. Uh, there may be some consideration of uh, funding coming from employers and employees, but we have to be very careful there because we don't want to do it at the expense of macroeconomic growth. And in countries that levy payroll taxes on employers and employees, it can often engender informality, even greater informality. And in India, we already have a very high level of informality. Uh, and, and secondly, it often uh, hurts overall economic growth because small and medium enterprises are forced to cut back on the number of employees. They may be forced to cut the quality of their products. They may be less competitive with other uh, markets uh, internationally. So we need to be very careful about levying a new tax on employers and employees. But nevertheless, we can put it into the mix of, um, of uh, sources of revenues. And a third area might be uh, 
consideration of new taxes. And here I would say that uh, there might be an opportunity to increase the sin tax in, in India, either tobacco or alcohol tax. Uh, by international standards, the tobacco tax today is quite low. It's quite low. So if you look at your neighbors in Turkey, if you look at your neighbors in Thailand or in Western Europe, their tobacco tax is, as a percentage, is about double what it is in India. So there's an opportunity there to, to think about that. There's also the issue of how you allocate money to states from the central level and do it in a fair and equitable way and for purposes of health care. Then we need to think about pooling and management of funds. And here I would say there's a great challenge in India for increasing the level of prepayment. Prepayment to cover the poor, to cover the, the sick, uh, and uh, to pool funds from the, the healthy to the sick, from the rich to the poor. Uh, and here again, I think you have design choices, whether you do that through one pool at the central level or whether you do that through multiple risk pools at each state, a la Canada, in a similar way that Canada does it. Uh, this is a, something you need to think about. Finally, in terms of strategic purchasing, India has a long way to go. A long way to go moving from its current system of line item budgets, moving more towards paying on the basis of performance, paying on the basis not on inputs as it does now, but paying on the basis of outputs and health outcomes. So these are some of the challenges that you face today in health financing. But I think the way forward is to look at options and to come up with a system across these three dimensions that will work for India. Don't borrow from any individual country of the world, but think about each of these functions and think about the best solution across these three functions or dimensions of health financing. And I think that that way India will be able to come up with its own model that works for India. And on a related note, how do you say the government should think about prioritizing its expenditure or targeting its schemes so that there are some people who argue that maybe the allocation between primary, secondary and tertiary sector needs to be rethought about. There are some who say that maybe the allocation between curative and the preventive functions needs to be thought about. So what are your views on this? Well, I think that prevention is certainly important. And as India matures as an economy, it will move more into a disease profile of non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cancer. These are already huge issues, but will only get worse as you, as you go forward in the next few years. And of course, in part, this has to do with behaviors. This has to do with, with, with laws and regulations outside of the health sector. For example, seat belts with cars, example, helmets for motorcycles, example, syntax on tobacco. Um, uh, so these are the kinds of things that might be done outside of the health sector. At the same time, you need adequate funding for prevention uh, within the, and, uh, and public health within the sector. Uh, in terms of primary versus secondary, I'm a fan, I'm a believer in an in integrated care approach. So I don't think you allocate so much for primary care in a separate pot, so much for secondary care in a separate pot. I believe that what you need to do is pool your risk and be a strategic purchaser so that you really go and find the best combination and the best integration of care across these three levels of care. So that would be my advice. That's, that, again, varies by country. That varies by the, the mix of uh, human resources and supplies that are available. That will probably change over time. But nevertheless, as a starting point, we need to think about how we can pool funds under some prepayment scheme and really start to find ways to purchase services, again, based on outputs and outcomes. So you've done a lot of work in China. In your writings about China's march towards universal coverage, you've spoken about how the government increased a lot in terms of health expenditure, but despite that, there remained a lot of disparity between the level of development in urban areas and rural areas. Now, that's something which rings true for India as well. Is there a way to design these policies or the incentives in a way to mitigate this risk of urban-rural divide? It's a very good question. And to some extent, this urban-rural divide has to do with input cost. Of course, labor is more expensive in the urban areas than it is in the rural areas. 
but to a great extent it has to do with allocation of funding. Uh, and allocation of funding uh, in China really uh, became very divided and very inequitable because of the way the health insurance system was designed. So there were separate health insurance systems for urban areas and separate health insurance systems for rural areas. Uh, further, uh, they were divided all the way down from the central level to the provincial level uh, to the county level in the rural areas, which further created inequities. So in China, you know, previously I talked about having one risk pool for the country or one risk pool per state in India. In China, you found thousands of risk pools, over 3,000 risk pools because of the design of the health insurance system. Now, that was done in part to bring in participation of local actors, local leaders. But the Chinese were very smart in realizing once they did that, that they needed to then start pooling risk at higher levels. And so what they have done is to start going province by province and start pooling those funds uh, so that there is going to be one risk pool for each province, each of the 34 or 35 provinces in China, the administrative regions. So I think the Chinese are moving very fast and their ambition is to have these risk pools in place by the year 2020. Now, a risk pool for each province and a standard benefit package for every citizen, no matter where you live, will allow greater equity will allow greater equity. There are still challenges in terms of making sure that the distribution of hospitals, of primary care clinics, of doctors, uh, auxiliary health personnel, that you have the distribution in place to allow equal access across urban and rural areas. But nevertheless, from a financing standpoint, the Chinese are on track to reach this more equitable uh, situation by the year 2020. And it's a good lesson for India. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Mr. Langenberner has shared his insights on how we should be thinking about health financing issues in India. He discussed the various sources of revenue collection, but also cautioned that in choosing the right mix, we should be mindful of the overall macroeconomic health of the country. One innovative solution that he discussed is the levy of a sin tax on products like alcohol and tobacco, which can help us in moving from negative to positive health outcomes.